for those of you who aren't familiar with this format, we're going to, Dr. Carter and I are going to go over some slides and then take Q&A. And the topic today is the glycemic index. Really, we're not even going to go over the glycemic load today, just the glycemic index and how different foods will very rapidly throw sugar into your bloodstream and just to affect your metabolic profile, your diabetes profile, file, if you will. And then we'll go over a dietary style that I recommend. And then I'll give you a lot of resources for how to know what foods are, are throw a lot of sugar into your bloodstream and what foods throw very little sugar into your bloodstream. And, uh, but most importantly, I want you to appreciate the difference between a food that is very nutrient rich versus a food that's not so nutrient rich. And I have tons of charts that I have at the end of this talk that will be a resource for you um, when we publish this video and put it up on, on YouTube. So you'll be able to go through it and look at it and um, see the charts, you know, at, at your leisure. You don't have to worry about it today so much, but I'll just go over it and cover some of the highlights. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a, uh, a three minute countdown until when we start. A lot of people come in, you know, a little bit after noon normally. So, and the reason why we call it sweet heart attack, it's all about the sugar. And one of the most significant downstream health effects of um, excess sugar in your blood is inflammation and how that affects your heart. People with uh, diabetes have much more of all kinds of different um, chronic conditions from Alzheimer's from David Perlmutter to more heart disease, neuropathy, things of that nature, chronic fatigue, retaining water and then having to wake up in the middle of the night and yeah. disrupt your sleep and go to the bathroom. All these things are related to it. Um, weight gain and your, your inability to get <laughs> an ideal weight regardless of your good efforts. So all, the, all those things come into play in this particular area. Good morning, Dr. Lewis. Good morning. I can't see who's speaking, but who is this? Charlie Smith. <laughs> Dr. Smith. The doctors Indeed. are out. There you go. Enjoy having you on board. Thank you. Feel free as a, as a good doctor to chime in if you here are things you'd like to contribute. Will do. And if you don't feel you're going to participate in the conversation, please mute yourself. I can't mute everybody. Um, because I don't want to mute everybody. Like I don't want Dr. Carter muted. I don't want Dr. Smith muted. So um, to avoid disruption, please try to find and hit the mute button. And then at the end, we'll take questions, but I mainly want to take questions through the chat. So find, you know, navigate through your chat if you're going to have questions. And you can throw the questions out right away and they'll just uh, accumulate and we'll cover them at the very end. So without further ado, let, let's chat about um, the glycemic index and sweet heart attack. And I think um, the point I want to make right up front is your digestive tract is like a conveyor belt. Okay. Everything that you will benefit from will be absorbed in the intestines. And in order to get it absorbed, it has to be liquefied. So the number one thing that holds a lot of people back when it comes to health and even causing diabetes or um, other chronic conditions 
is your ability to absorb well. Okay, you are what you absorb, not what you eat. So next month, at the beginning of the month, we always do a, a more of a simple talk, theme talk. And so we'll talk about um, gut health and digestion, but it plays a very big role in, um, in, in sugars. Now on that conveyor belt, I'll give you an example. Fructose from high fructose corn syrup or even fruit has a lot of fructose. And fructose is probably the easiest thing you can absorb goes right to the liver and provides you a lot of energy. I call fructose rocket fuel, very high glycemic index. So if you're a rocket, when you're a rocket, having fructose is a really good, good thing because you need to sustain the propulsion of that rocket, not a problem. But on the continuum of digestion absorption, not everything is digested and absorbed like fructose. And the most difficult thing to digest and absorb are little teeny rocks we call minerals. And if you've seen my video, The Genesis of Health, that we did early in January, minerals are extremely important to the electrical system of your, you know, in your body and corresponding health. Enzymes are critically important to rebuilding tissue, so repair and recovery. They're the hardest thing to absorb. So you gotta make sure you have a good gut. And so many people have high elevated, have elevated sugars in their bloodstream and or cannot lose weight because their brain is looking to make sure that your enzymes are working optimally. That means you're digesting and absorbing minerals properly. What does this have to do with the glycemic index? Well, actually everything, because if you're eating foods that are just supplying a lot of calories, like a very high glycemic food, particularly junk food, then you'll have plenty of calories, but your brain is not that simplistic. Your brain is looking at everything in your body, particularly do you have good repair and recovery pathways going on? Because all of us have wear and tear. And what longevity is all about is compensating for that wear and tear with good repair and recovery. So having the minerals in your system to run your enzymes, to run your electrical system, extraordinarily, extraordinarily important. Okay, so what I, what I tell people is literally from a lab perspective, if your erythrocyte sedimentation rate is up or if you're overweight and struggling to gain that perfect weight or your insulin's up, what it really means is you're malnourished. You're literally malnourished. You have plenty of calories, plenty of calories. If you have any body fat whatsoever, you have plenty of stored calories. What you don't have are the mineral nutrients that are water soluble and you're shedding them every day when you, when you, uh, when you pee, when you urinate. So that's how this ties into overall health. So it's not just about the heart attack, the diabetes. It's much more about your repair and recovery pathways and keeping you healthy to as close to the day that you die as possible. Okay, so I have a bunch of slides that just sort of discuss this, you know. Some people look at their label and they say, well, I'm not eating, um, I'm not eating many sugars but they're eating a lot of carbohydrates and carbohydrates are broken down fairly easily, particularly the so-called high glycemic, and we'll talk about what those are, uh, carbohydrates, to sugars very quickly. So for example, on the glycemic scale, sucrose has a number, I think it's a, of, a, of 100. But a potato, which doesn't officially contain sugar in it, because of the fact that it's so loaded with simple carbohydrates has the exact same glycemic in index or maybe even a little higher glycemic index. What that means is if you have a teaspoon of sugar and a teaspoon equivalent of potato, you eat that and then we measure your blood sugar, the potato will actually cause your blood sugar, your glucose to go higher than, than the table sugar. 
So that's really the essence of the glycemic index. So carbs equal sugar. If you have a high carb diet, you have a high sugar diet. Maybe you can ameliorate that a little bit by going and eating foods that are lower on the glycemic index. All that means is the carbohydrate that has what are called non-digestible or slowly digestible and slowly digestible carbohydrates. So it's not breaking down to the sugars as quickly. So recognizing the food you're eating and where they lie on that glycemic scale makes a big difference because in so many ways, it's not the amount of calories, it's how easily digested and absorbed they are and how quickly they're absorbed. So a low glycemic carbohydrate will absorb much more quickly. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, a low glycemic carbohydrate will absorb much more slowly and have much less impact on your blood sugar. So I'm gonna show this chart over and over again, sort of in different ways, but really what we see is a high glycemic food will rush blood sugar into your body and then insulin will go up and push the blood sugar down and you can actually have this hunger crash and create this vicious cycle. Whereas a low glycemic will just trickle some calories into your bloodstream and you won't have that peak and valley. Very important. So um, you can very easily reset your eating habits. And it's not just by picking low glycemic foods in general. Even when you pair a higher glycemic with a low glycemic or a fat or a protein, it actually reduces how the impact of that high glycemic food on your overall blood sugar. So you're not just destined to never eat high glycemic foods again if you use pairing strategy. And at the end, I'll give you a link to a, a video that Dr. Carter and I produced on what I call just, it's not a dietary style, it's plate rearrangement style. So you get the maximum amount of nutrients into your body while reducing the spiking of the sugar. And the other comment I would have is that someone very insulin sensitive, very low insulin, very low glucose in their bloodstream, you know, optimal glucose, optimal triglycerides, optimal A1C, they can eat that potato and probably have no spike or very minimal spike in their sugar and their insulin. So they don't have the crash and they don't have this perpetuating problem that leads to diabetes. Whereas someone uh, very insulin resistant, so diabetes is just a human made term for pretty severe insulin resistant. That means insulin, the hormone that pushes sugar out of your bloodstream is not that effective at getting it into your cells. So it's pushing it elsewhere to cancer, to infection, to fat storage, because insulin's job is to keep your blood glucose in a very narrow range, in a non-inflammatory range in a range where your repair and recovery processes can keep, a, keep up with or ahead of the natural wear and tear that we experience in our body. So here's a little more detailed uh, review of this. When you eat a high glycemic or very sugary food or a very high glycemic carbohydrate food is what you'll see. The green bars is how much energy you're using. And, and I've, I work with a lot of athletes and they always think when they're athletic, they're, they're double, tripling, quadrupling the number of calories that they're consuming compared to someone sedentary. And it's really not that, that high. Yesterday I did a uh, very challenging four hour bike ride into the mountains. And when I was done, I burned, you know, 2,500 calories, that's a pound. Um, but it wasn't 10,000 calories, you know? And someone else may be burning. So maybe that, that day I burned three to 4,000 calories where someone who's more sedentary is only burning 2,500 calories. It's not a huge difference. So the difference in our energy burn between resting down here and going full tilt activity up here is not that big. Our calorie demand on a minute by minute daily basis 
is not that much different regardless of what we're doing. But when we take in that sugary food, boom, we will get a spike well outside of that range. And this is the fat gain regime because all these excess calories are processed in the liver for storage. This is a very natural phenomenon. You know, it's called um, sort of the, when we had the agrarian cycle, which was more natural, we would feast and famine. We feasted because food supply wasn't guaranteed. And we would store that as fat for later use. And then we might have some famine and we'd pull from that fat. But what's happening in America in particular, we're going through these feast and famine cycles with our children, sadly, sometimes several times a day. And that's what leads to the insulin resistance, the fat gain, mal malnutrition, because a lot of these calories are empty, and chronic diseases. So it's a, a vicious cycle. And then just following this through a little bit more is normally when the sugar goes up, insulin goes up afterwards in response to elevated sugar. And that's why we see the crash, because insulin essentially overshoots and pushes that sugar way down under. And then we just keep doing this cycle over and over and over again. So one of the key markers is um, just looking to see what I have for slides here. I don't have my favorite slide on this one, but we talked about it at another talk. But basically, what is, how do we measure sugar? Well, in my opinion, we should be measuring fasting insulin. We don't even need the other tests. That's the most important marker because the pathology or really the physiology, the blood, it's a, it's a condition of insulin resistance. So I'm going to use a quote from the drug ads. Ask your doctor. Ask your doctor why they're measuring glucose in A1C and not measuring the real marker of the condition, fasting insulin. Because in your physiology, your sugars go up, but actually your insulin will go up first, trying to con control your blood sugars into this, this range. So the most forward-looking marker for your metabolic status is your fasting insulin, not the glucose. Glucose will vary. The more insulin resistant you are, the more likely you are to have a glucose even under fasting. That's not optimal. And then the last marker, which is really disturbing for me that gets used so much in diagnosing people with metabolic syndrome is your A1C. And A1C is simply, by the way, you only have one teaspoon of sugar circulating in your bloodstream at any one time. You know, you have a lot of glycogen uh, that you can pull very quickly. Then we have this glycolated or what my wife calls caramelized sugar. So literally, A1C is the percent of red blood cells that have been glycolated or, or you know, bound with sugar to create this caramelized um, sugar-covered red blood cell. So the reason why A1C is not a very good marker, it, it's important. I'm not saying it's not important, but it's looking back four months. Red blood cells stay in circulation for four months. So if you uh, listen to me and Dr. Carter four months from now, every red blood cell in your circulation will be different than, than what's there today. So you can change your A1C just over time because you're always replacing red blood cells. So if you reduce your sugars, your A1C is gonna go down. The only problem is it's backwards looking. So I've had participants that have done everything right and their insulin came down, their triglycerides came down, their fasting glucose came down. But at the time of the test, three months after the program started, their A1C was actually elevated. And their traditional doctor put them on more insulin or more metformin. But they're using data that's old. It's irrelevant. Um, so it's a real challenge. But, you know, if you really want to know what your malnutrition status is, what your sugar status is, the test you want is your fasting insulin. That's the most important marker.
Now, I have a very dear friend doctor down in uh, Ocala, Florida, who works in these fairly funded uh, medical clinics and has her own clinic. And she said to me, Tom, you know, I can't even do a, I can't even do a, a, a liver assessment, you know, as, a, as an old fashioned doctor where you actually feel that area in your body from the outside. And, you know, you can, a good, a good doctor can discern the health of the liver. She said, everybody I work with now has some level of fatty liver from as simple, as simple as this, excess sugars, go to the liver, converted trigs, converted to stored fatty acid. And when this goes on long enough, you start collecting fatty deposits in your liver. And, and the best sign for that is, you know, you're looking at your uh, liver enzymes. People will have their ALT and AST levels that are starting to go up. And so, you know, that's not, um, not a good sign. You know, alcoholism can lead to a fatty liver going up but also just having all kinds of excess trigs from converting that feast and famine process day in and day out can do the same thing. So a non-alcoholic fatty livers is on the rise. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is caused by excess sugar. And, you know, Dr. Carter, Dr. Carter, you want to chime in on the, on the fatty liver? I've, I've been going strong here and not bringing you into the conversation or anything I've spoken, spoken about so far. No, well, that's correct. I mean, yeah, I mean, that is, we have epidemic proportions of fatty liver these days, especially our children. And again, it's, it is driven by, you know, the refined carbohydrate diets and, and um, very, very common. So, yeah, we need to really turn that around because, you know, the liver function, the liver being the major detoxification organ, um, that's contributing to, you know, a whole host of, uh, disease syndromes. So mm, the, the vast majority of the patients that I work with definitely need, uh, liver support to really help, you know, turn their situation around. Yep. And, and once again, I use elevated triglycerides, you know, generally not, it's not perfectly accurate. Elevated glucose, elevated A1C as a greater sign of malnutrition. Your brain is looking for everything to work right in your body. And calories is the least of what the, what the brain is worried about. Most of us have historically not had a problem with access to calories. But, you know, the genesis of health, we talk about the, the soil and the food supply, lack of nutrients. That's really what your brain is worried about in your body. And it's only recourse is to make you hungry. So a lot of people said, I go on a calorie restricted diet and I've lost some weight, but I can't get there all, all the way. Why? Because their brain is continuing. They're fighting against a very strong force, your brain, because the brain knows that there's some malnutrition going on. So it's only recourse is to make you hungry. There's no wonder you can't lose, lose weight or, or, or make the ultimate goal. Well, Dr. Carter and I were involved in a corporate program where we had a weight loss program running side by side with ours, and some of the people overlapped. And um, I was very excited to look at the data six months after I tested them and Dr. Carter tested them to see where they, what happened. And we had a small group of people that decided they weren't going to really fully take our advice. For example, they said, I'm not going to take a cod liver oil capsule it has 17 calories that goes against my calories. And it's like, okay, <laughs> but what we, what we showed is that people that started off with bad labs at the end of six months, their labs were worse. Why? Because they weren't following our nutritional counseling. The weight loss program didn't have very good nutritional counseling. So they reduced the amount of food they were taking in. So they reduced the number of calories, but more importantly, they were reducing the number of nutrients, which were already insufficient. So there's only one place your labs can go worse. And they did. So, you know, what insulin did does, I, I kind of already talked about this. This is a hormone. Look, hormones regulate things. Glucose is just a fuel. It's, it's secondary. 
Um, the hormone is released by the pancreas and it's responsible for pushing sugar. Okay, so you have a human cell, there's the insulin, pushes the sugar in, everything's happy. But the cells get it, you know, uh, watch some of Jason Fung's stuff. Jason Fung, the diet doctor, his, he enlightened me several years ago when I, when I was watching some of his stuff. But, you know, he thinks that the cell just gets filled up or it may be a membrane issue, but either way, the cell is resisting this. But insulin's job is not to feed your cell. Insulin's job is to keep the glucose in a narrow regi regime from about 65 to 80, 82, that is not inflammatory based on repair and recovery pathways. So the insulin will find any mechanism it can, any place it can to send the sugars. So if the cell is resistant, yeah, it'll recruit more little insulin buddies to push it into the cell. But in the meantime, it's not relying just on that to bring your glucose down into a normal range. It'll push it to the liver. It'll push it to the infection. It'll push it to the cancer. That's why diabetics have much higher levels of cancer um, than um, people that are insulin sensitive. If you want to live a long, healthy life, you want your insulin to low four. You know, every study on longevity is like with calorie restriction. And hopefully you now know that it's not about calories, it's about nutrients. But they do these studies in, in very controlled environments with worms and animals, and they show they live a long time. But if you ever took that animal out of that cocoon of protection and put it into the real world, it's gonna die very quickly. It hasn't built resilience. But this is just a little, little image about the cell, the receptors, and how insulin works to push the, the fuel into the cell. And, and, and some people project that you, know, you start losing these receptors. So you need more and more insulin. And then you also need more and more sugar outside the cell between more insulin and more sugar to take advantage of the fact that there are fewer receptors to get that fuel into the cell. So cancer, it'll take that excess glucose and insulin is happy to push it in this direction because its job is to keep the sugars in an out range. Fat cells, bacteria, viruses, anything that's using fuel. Okay, so here we go again, but this just sort of looking at the, just trying to like imprint this, this image in. So here's our fuel demands. And here's a high glycemic food, but also I put it on an empty stomach. You know, one of my, uh, one of my good friends now that hired Dr. Carter and I to be part of a, a corporate program, you know, she, um, her insulin despite having spent a couple hundred thousand dollars with a functional doctor that did help her with Lyme, did say probably, she argued would save her life. She's insulin resistant. And so I said, you know, what's going on? You do a dietary review, a food journal, okay? So her snack between meals was dried fruit, very concentrated in fructose. So despite the fact that it's fruit, quote unquote healthy, she was getting large spikes and this was adding up over time to insulin resistance and, and elevated fasting insulin. So why I say empty stomach is if you eat a full meal and eat a small amount of drug or dessert, you're probably not gonna have that spike because it's the absorption, which is the average of everything that's in your stomach. Okay, so here's high glycemic on a full stomach and then the reason why the ketogenic diet works is just these things are absorbed and converted to fuel more slowly. So the profile of calories available to you when you're eating a higher fat diet is distributed more uniformly across the, your need for energy. So look, we're, a hummingbird is a race car on hydrogen peroxide. You need super fast fuel or the space shuttle, but we're a diesel engine. And so fats are like the diesel fuel. Whereas anything else, unless you're very active, is a fuel that is too energetic in terms of delivering quick calories. You know, you don't put, you don't put gasoline in a diesel engine and vice versa. 
but we're doing that every day. So here's just a little, just, you know, our brain needs 10 times more energy than regular cells. The carotid artery is bringing blood to your brain, 25%. There's some interesting things around the 25%. I'll go over both of them. But 25% of the oxygenated blood leaving your heart dumps its oxygen in your brain. Your brain is 10 times more active. But guess what? That means it has 10 times more wear and tear. So it needs those nutrients to do the detoxification and um, repair and recovery pathways. So that's, that's why your brain will keep you hungry, even if you're eating, you know, um, quote unquote, plenty of calories. If it's not nutrient dense, you're losing that battle. So the other interesting component of this is that not only is your brain 25, uh, 10 times more metabolic, it has 10 times uh, on a per weight basis, 10 times more cholesterol, free cholesterol, not LDL, free cholesterol than any other tissue. Why? Harvard Health, if, if you look at Dr. Carter and my videos and blogs on how not to die young, cholesterol is an essential component of every membrane. So if you're wearing and tearing a lot because you're so metabolically active, then you have a lot more repair going on. And that's why the cholesterol is up there. I was just talking to my wife earlier today. It's like we were just describing something from an interpersonal nature. And I use a very weird way of describing it. It's like every mammal has a high amount of cholesterol in their brain, not just humans. So, um, you know, is cholesterol really that bad? But anyway, it's there for, for purpose. But the point of the slide is your brain is extraordinarily metabolically active. It, yes, it needs fuel. It runs much better on ketone bodies, on fat fuel, but it also needs the nutrients to go with it. So what I don't want to say is leave you with, oh, it needs fuel. Every time you think about food, I want you to change the culture the way you think about things. Nutrients first, calories second. Ask yourself if you have stored calories. And the answer is probably yes. Ask yourself if you have stored nutrients. The answer is a little bit, but they're in your bones. You don't want to strip your bones of nutrients to keep your heart running. You want to be supplying that every day through your food. So the new vernacular is I'm eating strictly for nutrients. Nutrients is what it's all about. So let's see. So it, it's pretty simple. Um, there's nothing wrong with carbohydrate foods as long as it looks like a vegetable. And the reason why vegetables are so profoundly important, if you look at the, um, the videos we did, the Genesis of Health as a two-part series, is that the soil is rich in nutrients and the plants convert those nutrients into things that are essential for us that we can't necessarily produce on our own. Essential nutrients by definition are things that we can't manufacture from base, base ingredients. We have to get those specific nutrients from food, essential nutrients. Um, I stand against certain antioxidants as supplements, but the good thing is all our, a lot of our good foods are have antioxidants in them and essential vitamins, you know, blueberries, all kinds of other fruit. Uh, why I have the nuts and seeds up here is we'll do a talk on um, nutrient density beyond this one at some point, but these are extraordinarily high in nutrient density and good fat calories too. Herbs and spices, extremely high in uh, nutrient density. So if you want to increase your nutrient density, spice up your food. That's why the Asian Indians, even, even when they're vegetarians, are, can be very healthy. Uh, we need our vitamin C, obviously, against COVID. Um, garlic is a prebiotic, probiotic. I'm big on, on fish. I know a lot of people are adverse and they think there's a lot of mercury in it. Get it from a good source. I, I am... Dr. Kern and I are producing a new video on cod liver oil. We really dove down into contaminants and what they're going to um, manufacture these very important um, supplements um, that people shouldn't be worried about. 
Uh, I have a brand new testimonial from a lady who felt she was like a health professional. And she allows me to share this with everybody. She felt she was this, she's an occupational therapist with a master's degree, this close from having a stroke based on what she's seen in her family and her participants and swears that high dose cod liver oil completely changed her pathway. Um, so really, really important. Um, you know, our children are, <clears throat> are a victim. Madison Ave <clears throat> advertises all these things. You know, cheap foods. The USDA subsidizes wheat, corn, barley, sorghum, soybean. So junk food at the store is artificially cheap compared to good food. Artificially because of subsidy. So all this is showing you, <clears throat> I'm no expert at reading these MRIs, but it's just saying that you know, these the sugars create addiction. So it becomes this vicious, vicious cycle. Not only are you nutrient deficient and your brain is making you hungry, but you're also addicted at the same time. It's a perfect storm. So having excess sugar, there's probably not a, I like this one. I didn't misspell it. It's hangry. I experienced this early in my marriage. Then we solved the insulin resistance and there's no more hangry anymore, but you literally get angry when you're hungry. Um, I'm sure that's not an uncommon thing, but everything you see here and more can be caused by having elevated fasting insulin. It's all about the continuum. <clears throat> you don't have to be diagnosed with diabetes. It's just where you are in the continuum and these symptoms and conditions will manifest sooner if your insulin is super high or later if it's not optimal. So the glycemic index, um, we have a very detailed glycemic index. Anybody who wants that in their note, if they're working with us, we'll put it in your document section. But basically we make it so it's pretty simple. Fruits, vegetables, meats, they don't really have a glycemic index, but in some respects, we're finding grains in meat. You know, we're finding carbohydrates in, in the meats these days. So the glycemic looks like this. Very high, if you're insulin resistant, very insulin resistant diabetic, you know, potato is an earth, a, a root crop. It's not a bad thing. It has nutrients in it, but it's something you should avoid until you become insulin sensitive. So I would say the more insulin sensitive it, you are, the more you can go towards the red end and get away with it. But the more towards the wrong side of the metabolic syndrome you are, the more you must stay in the green zone. So <clears throat> the basic recommendation is eat foods low on the glycemic index. Know what the glycemic in index is, have the color chart available to you, and what goes in your shopping cart is what you're gonna eat. So have this with you when you go to the store. Eliminate sugars from your diet, and there are so many ways that sugar are hidden on a label. But also look at the carbohydrate load on the label. Or more importantly, make the food you buy only has one ingredient on the label, and then you can tie it back to the glycemic index. Very simple. Um, eliminate processed food, lots of hidden carbs and sugars. Eat more healthy fats. They are fuel for the brain, and they will actually lower the glycemic index of that meal you ate. And then focus, of course, on nutrient density. We should think of food as nutrients, not as calories. So I had this little joke with Ty Bollinger, the head of um, the truth of him and his wife, Charlene, about the truth about cancer. And I was having lunch with him in Nashville a couple of years ago. And I said, Ty, I'm proud to be called a fathead. Okay, I've eaten fat. You know, when I was like 15 years old, 10 years old, I always ate the marrow, the bone and all the fat. And, um, it hasn't caught up to me yet if you think it's a bad thing. <laughs> I would argue it's not a bad thing. So I have a video here on what I call critical fats. It's the testimonial from this lady who felt that we averted a, a stroke. And then Dr. Carter and I have this uh, nutrient-dense eating style video. It's 38 minutes long, and it talks about Kate. how you can eat, how you can rearrange your plate, lose weight, 
and have more nutrients and use different flavor triggers to make that meal enjoyable. So I oh, hope that's, that's a, a valuable resource. And like I said, this will be up in a week or so. And so, yeah, if anybody wants to call me a fathead, I'm very, I'm very flattered. Um, and then in our resource section of this thing, uh, this video, we'll see all, all right, these, sounds all good. Different, um, all these different um, resources, dietary fiber, what foods are highest in, in dietary fiber. At the end of the day, high glycemic or low glycemic foods have a lot of undigestible carbohydrates, fiber. So that's a big that's a big advantage. And this is from the USDA and other sources. So it's not always perfect. So here's more on dietary fiber. No need to write it down. Uh, energy density. More on energy density. And I'll make sure when we publish this video that I give the re references on the, on the page. What's highest in vitamin C? More in vitamin C. Here's a broader glycemic index chart, one that we didn't create. We created our own, which I can make available to anybody working with us. Um, more on the glycemic index. And this also has the glycemic load, which is sort of the overall burden of that food, not just how quickly, but how much sugars it'll push out. Um, digestible calories, some foods you eat them. If I measure them in a bomb calorimeter to measure how many calories they put out, it'll put out this amount. But in digestion, if it's not absorbed through the intestine, then it's much lower. So those are the digestible calories. And that's really important that, under, that you'll understand when you watch our video on dietary style, how that relates. Um, omega content, very important for the brain. And lastly, nutritional content, fats, carbohydrates, fiber, calcium, iron, magnesium, whole bunch of other nutrients. So, um, you know, we're not going to blow these up or anything like that right now. It'll be in the video. You'll get to see them. The references will be there. And I hope it's a, a good guide for you. So let me, um, with that, we'll um, stop the share. Uh, all kinds of chat items, Dr. Carter. So <clears throat> someone asked, what about intermittent fasting and getting one large meal per day? Oh, absolutely. Intermittent fasting works quite well. That's what I do personally. And, you know, from a weight perspective, very easy to, you know, keep weight in check. Uh, it encourages, you know, autophagy or, you know, breakdown of bad cells, you know, in the body so that you're turning over, you know, good new cells and so forth. Um, it gives the body a chance to detoxify better. So, yeah, lots of benefits of intermittent fasting. I, I would say that that is, you know, an optimal way uh, for the vast majority of individuals to, to eat. And as a caveat with, um, you know, the ketogenic diet, it does have benefits, but um, I'm not a big fan of, you know, patients being on a ketogenic diet more than three to six months because, uh Generally, long-term use of ketogenic diets can actually promote insulin resistance in a, a good portion of the population. So that can obviously become quite problematic. Um, and use of, uh, you know, the good fats and so forth. Still, everyone is, is, is individual and, and different. So um, if you have genetic markers like the APOE 3-4 or 4-4, especially 4-4, um, then even the good fats can definitely be problematic in terms of, you know, uh, the cholesterol numbers, especially the, you know, the genesis of small particles and high number of particles, which can definitely be atherogenic and ultimately cause problems, especially in light of high inflammatory markers like the homocysteine and C-reactive protein. So, so again, at the end of the day, that's why, you know, we have our platform with testing 
of individuals so that we can see where you are, you know, as you go through, you know, these pathways. Yeah, the, the other comment, the other thing I'd like to add in is we had a gentleman that was, you know, labeled as um, Alzheimer's dementia. And what I did with him is we gave him a, a Myers cocktail infusion through the, the, the vessels rather than going through the gut. And he perked up for two days each time we did this. So in terms of the intermittent fasting, your minerals will hang around for a couple of days. But you'll, if you're going to do intermittent fasting for any length of time, you're going to make sure you're, you're and I would really recommend a, uh, a liquid based uh, vitamin mineral to go along with that. The next question is on HOMA IR, a better measurement. You know, I, I'm not sure what that test costs or whatever, but we do fasting insulin, trigs, glucose, A1C, uric acid. I think that's really adequate to pinpoint where you are on the metabolic continuum. Uh, Michael, what is the HOMA IR? I don't, I don't even, I don't do it. So It's just a calculated measurement, you know, of insulin. And I, I can't remember exactly, but it's a calculated number. Um, based on your insulin, I believe the fasting glucose and maybe hemoglobin A1C. Um, I have to look back at that, but yeah, so we're we're doing that essentially. But the most important number is for all you race fans, you want your insulin below below four, fasting insulin below four. And the other thing you know one can do because obviously these numbers change; they're very dynamic. You know, ideally you buy a um, glucometer, which is very inexpensive, you know, like $25. Um, and you want to test your, uh, what they call a postprandial um, glucose measurements. So like an hour after eating and two hours after eating. And ideally two hours after eating, the ideal situation is for your fasting glucose or your glucose to be, um, uh, very close to what your fasting, you know, glucose is. So if your fasting glucose is 85 and then you eat a meal and then an hour later, it's 150, you know, two hours later, the ideal thing is for it to be um, very close to that 85 or 90 number. Um, so then you can really kind of tell what foods are really causing your, you know, glucose and obviously you're not testing for your insulin with with this but but again you know by having you know prolonged elevated glucose levels that tells you your body is struggling and you're on that insulin resistant pathway right thank you um it's been proven that fatty liver disease is highly correlated with the amount of glyphosate i think it's really important to understand that it's almost never one thing you know, so glyphosate may contribute to it, but before glyphosate, there was the sugars. And I would say in our youth, it's probably more the sugar than the glyphosate. If you have a difference of opinion, Michael, um, feel free. Well, no, I mean, the glyphosate is definitely messing up the machinery. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but yeah, still more so, I, again, the, the liver is, you know, a major detoxification organ. And, uh, you know, lots of, you know, things happen in there, but glyphosate, yes, it is, is, is wreaking havoc. Um, you know, on patients, we, we have very, very effective ways of detoxing the body of glyphosate, you know, uh, three months, four months, five months. And, you know, because I test, I test glyphosate uh, levels in my patients. And that's, that's not a super expensive test, it's about $150. Um, and glyphosate is, is water soluble and it's everywhere. Even if you eat organic, everyone has a level of exposure of glyphosate. So I put, put my patients on those supplements that will help bind that um, and get it out of the body. Thank you. Then I have a long dissertation from from Wayne and all I can say is send me some of that smoothie. It sounds delicious, but you know, I'm not sure that raw potatoes are lower glycemic than the cook forms because it's a resistant starch, but either way, I mean, it's, it's mixing and pairing and make sure you put some healthy fats into that smoothie. I put walnut oil, I'll put avocado oil, I'll put MCT oil. I'm trying to oil it up. I'll even put a good quality, 
Dr. Carter Closure Ears, a good quality, um, organically raised um, heavy cream. <laughs> I don't have a dairy problem. Um, things like that. And then I cannot, I can never remember the name of the Dr. Campbell. It's not Colin Campbell, but this Russian lady now who practices in England that um, says, you know, the difference between an apple with fructose and a junk food with fructose is that the apple comes with all the nutrients to help you absorb and, uh, you know, digest it and use it. So when you eat the junk food, you've got to strip from something else in your body for those nutrients to make it work. So fruit is a much better choice. You're just not eating concentrated fruit or a lot of fruit on an empty stomach if your fasting insulin isn't four or below. That's, that's the kind of thing that, that I'm trying to express here. I wonder if making the smoothies too smooth raises sugar levels too quickly. Just add the fats. Add the, do not neglect the fats. You know, I'm a fat head and I'm a big fat fan because of that. Um, <laughs> is it a good approach to eat fruit as a dessert with a meal? Yes. So the sugar in the fruit can be assimilated with the fats, proteins, carbs, and meal. Absolutely. How high of a dose is high dose cod liver oil? Um, you know, if you look at the video that I have out there on, on cod liver oil, Amy, is that in the British hospitals in 1848, they were giving for tuberculosis as much as 50 grams a day. So two tablespoons, two measuring tablespoons, not these, these little phony tablespoons you get with your uh, plate setting, but a real measuring tablespoon is 15 grams. So I've had plenty of people on 30 grams a day for say three months to kind of remodel their tissue, then they can back down to the 15 grams or even less. So right now I'm on, um, I'm doing about 15 grams of cod liver oil twice a week. Cause I mean, my tissue is pretty much remodeled and I'm very careful not to take in the junky omega-6s. Hopefully that answers that. Um, has anyone actually done the lab work and followed someone's mercury levels over a few months or years and tracked how much, uh, how safe Alaskan wild salmon they are eating? Michael, any idea on that? Um, well, again, yeah, I, I test patients for, you know, um, heavy metals, including mercury. I, I really like um, the Quicksilver um, for the mercury tri test, which tests for the speciation of the mercury you know, the ethyl mercury and the methyl mercury uh, and so forth, and how well your body is able to um, eliminate it um, through uh, the urinary tract. So, but yes, um, generally speaking, uh, wild caught salmon is a much better choice. Of course, most of the, the big fish, the tuna and, you know, grouper and, and all of that, uh, has a significant uh, level of mercury. Um, but again, it's, it's still how your body can detoxify. I mean, obviously there are individuals that are better able to um, detoxify the mercury, especially from food sources. Um, but um, yeah, so, so it really boils down to testing and, and, and correlating that to symptoms. Someone asked about honey. I mean, we, we had a severe rheumatoid arthritis, um, diabetic, high blood pressure person who would never go to the doctor, sort of natural, but they raised their own honey with their bees and they were definitely eating too much honey. So once again, honey has nutrients in it. Maple syrup has nutrients in it, but a breakfast shouldn't be pancakes and maple syrup. I mean, I, we all know that, right? But it's all about pairing it. I used to put honey in my coffee every morning and I've weaned off that now and I'm, I'm honey free. So most of us just have too many simple carbs in our diet and it would behoove everybody to not look for these substitutes, but wean yourself off them. Monk fruit, you know, stevia actually has some anti, anti infective properties. So stevia is something really interesting. Um, so I don't have a problem with stevia. The, the, the um, sugar, sugar alcohols tend to be pretty good. 
but you know, you need them. You know, there's probably, you can probably wean yourself off that. Um, what is a good brand for cod liver oil? We use Carlson's Nordic Naturals, but the testimonial, they use the, um, the fermented version, Michael. That lady used the fermented version because she had it. What is the yeah, green, green pasture is a is a good pasture. good brand as well. I, I like that. I use that for myself as well. You know, if you watch the um, video, it, it talks about that the Dr. Carter and I have on our dietary style. It talks about protein. So we had someone with a good a good insulin, a good glucose, but elevated A1C. You know, protein gluconeogenesis will go to um, sugars as well. So I think most of us, especially athletes, think they need three times the uh, protein that someone else needs. No, unless you're Eddie Hall, you don't. So we're all eating too much protein. We're all eating too much food in general. Um, and unfortunately, last, uh, is some starch necessary or can we truly live without it, even if we are athletic? And I think the answer is uh, there are pretty good authorities on this and said we pretty much can live without it but i think you need vegetables so you don't want to go carnivore or only protein and fat that's really bad so yeah that's yeah not a good always, idea you're always going to get some carbohydrates in fact i advocate increasing the number of vegetables you eat decreasing the amount of protein you eat and upping your fats a little bit so you actually should be eating more vegetables and fats and less carbs but we have two minutes. I'm going to have Dr. Carter answer. How do you detoxify glyphosate? Oh, so, I mean, there are several ways. Um, calcium deglucarate, um, I like that. Um, but um, I use the um, fulvix and humix from uh, cell core bioscience and just uh, amazing, amazing. So um, that is not on our full script. So you would have to just contact me to um to order that but that works like magic to detoxify the body of uh, glyphosate all righty thanks everybody for your participation participation and uh next week we don't know yet but it'll be something probably a little more scientific and technical than today's i thought it was great today thank you Thank you. Bye for now.